Good afternoon uh, uh, to, to all of you. I'm, uh, I'm very pleased to be here this, this morning. I've, I'm, I believe I'm a regular feature at FICI, and, and, and therefore I have, to, I, have, I have to be very careful that uh, I don't just go on repeating what I've said to you before. Uh, but um, obviously, ministers must be consistent. Uh, they, must not be, they must not change their mind every day. Uh, and as I understand uh, from, from uh, the fact that you've been thrown off your time schedules a bit, uh, ministers should also be precise, concise, and brief. Uh, and that's what I shall, I shall try to be. Uh, delighted to be here uh, as, the, the, uh, as a guest of uh, Nena Lal Kidwai, President, in her, uh, in her final uh, uh, overs of, uh, of a very delightful match that we have watched. Uh, and we would uh, wait to see how many sixes she gets uh, in the closing balls. Uh, Mr. Didar Singh, of course, Secretary General uh, and, uh, and a good friend, both from time and government. Um, and it's good to see how government can seamlessly move into private sector, and private sector can seamlessly move into government. Uh, very eminent, eminent uh, panelists, um, captains of industry, a very, very distinguished uh, audience that we have here, uh, friends from the media, ladies and gentlemen. I was, uh, uh, I caught the last, L, last bit that uh, the most eminent uh, panelist today, Mr. Maurice uh, Levy, was, was saying to you, and I, I caught something about, uh, something about a tragic incident that happened last year. Um, I should know what, what that means because uh, uh, it was a tragic incident that, uh, that really shook the conscience of this nation. Uh, not because these things haven't happened before or haven't happened since. Uh, we live in a complicated world. We live in a world of envy, in a world of, of disease, in a world of, of discomfort, in a world of, of uh, uh, diseased minds. Uh, and the best efforts and best intentions of any society in the world today, any society, and underline any society, to ensure that we live in peace and we live uh, in dignity uh, is belied by incidents that happen all the time. And I, I just want to say this to you, that, that I understand uh, something going viral and something, something uh, influencing the media and influencing public opinion uh, across the globe. Uh, but I think that there is something called proportionality. Uh, we don't even grieve uh, anymore uh, because we have been told that grief is also something that must come uh, in a manner that is dignified. There were times when in India, uh, and it's still available, those models are still available, where uh, young people, uh, young wives, for having lost their husbands, had to grieve with great passion, and they had to show that they were, they were grieving. Uh, because if they were not, uh, then it was thought that they were really insensitive. And it's, uh, it was upon us to say that it's not that important. You don't have to break your bandwidths, and you don't have to pull your hair, and you don't have to tear your clothes, because grief is something that can be, can be conducted in a manner that, that allows, you, allows you to live with hope, even in those terrible moments of grief. India is a country, don't forget, where women used to go on to the pyre of their husbands uh, because that was the only way they sh could show allegiance and faith and, and, uh, and commitment to their husbands who had died. But we changed that. We changed the law. Uh, and we changed the law and we said that this is not acceptable. Uh, and we, went, we got to a point where we, where, where, where we have reached today where men and women are equal in this country. But what we can do is we can help men and women become equal in terms of their ability to contribute to society and equal in terms of their capacity to take from society. This is what we can do, and we have done that. And I think that's apparent from the fact that uh, although only two of them are present here, uh, but if you just look around and uh, on another day you could have many more sitting here than they are. And there are two outstanding women who are there, not because they are women. They are, they are outstanding because they are outstanding. They are outstanding Indians and something that we are proud of today. But what we can't do easily, 
What we can't do easily is to make people, men and women, equal in their ability to do violence. Now that you can't change. People, uh, the males in, in humanity and in amongst animals are made for greater violence. What we can do is through education control and give them control of their violent, violent sentiments. But we cannot reduce them to non-violence simply by wishing them to be non-violence equally. But then the biggest message of non-violence that somebody has given in this country, frankly, was a man. But then you say he was not a man, he was an, a he was, he was an angel. He was a saint, and that was Mahatma Gandhi. The greatest, the greatest and I believe the permanent message of non-violence was given by none other than, than Mahatma Gandhi. So I think it is upon us, each one of us, to be proportionate in our understanding of the remarkably dramatic changing reality of India. There is an India that is very different, that you want to address, that you try to address, and you address it through CSR, and you address it through sensitive labor policies, and you address it through institutional decisions, and you address it through challenges to establish norms and establish institutions, political parties and organizations. And that's the wonder of Indian democracy, that we are able to do this, and that we have been able to do this successfully. And, but there is an India that hasn't changed yet. And there is an India that is holding back and resisting. But let me just tell you, that India and the reality, ugly India, ugly reality of that India is no different from the ugly reality of Harlem. But we don't spend our time in, the, in India talking only about the, the ugly reality of Harlem. We know it's there. We know it's there. And we are sensitive. And I know that, that the American society is doing its best to tackle, tackle these problems. We also have certain, we have certain uh, issues on which we believe that we've done better than anywhere else in the world. India, from the first day of its democracy, gave equal rights to its men and women. That was not true about other democracies in the world. Other democracies took a long time. But that is not to say that we sit, sit back on our laurels and say, all is beautiful and all is fine. There's a lot that is to change. And the lot that is to change is a change that is taking place now and here. And what we want is encouragement. What we want is understanding. What we want is consultation. We don't want to be lectured. And we don't want to be told how bad we are. We know that we have warts. And we know that we have scars. And we know that we have shortcomings. And that is the very purpose of modern vital Indian democracy to ensure that we can address these issues. And we have tried every instrument of law, of constitutional jurisprudence. We have tried every single instrument to address what are problems. But everything that might appear to be a problem may not be a problem. Indian legal system may be slow. Indian legal system may not be, may, may not be the best in terms of the complaints that an individual may have about its inability to sensitively respond to what the Indian legal system does to their aspirations. But I'll tell you one thing. The Indian Supreme Court has said we will not handcuff people because it lowers a person's dignity to be handcuffing them. The Indian Supreme Court has said, I am sorry, the American Supreme Court has not said this. I am sorry the American Supreme Court has not said it. I've been the law minister in this country. I do not believe that I ever heard in my life expressions like cavity searches. I never heard an expression like that as a law minister and a lawyer. But I do understand. I do understand that circumstances may be different. I do understand that situations may be different. But I also understand, may I also understand that there are people who don't understand. And you're not the only people. People in America are not the only people who don't understand. There are people in India who don't understand. People do not like the idea that I said, if I do not get justice for my diplomat in the United States of America, I will not come back to parliament. Was that a terrible thing to say? There are people who think that I am being, uh, I'm being dramatic in saying that. Somebody said to me, there are 50,000 Muslims in Muzaffarnagar, and you didn't say you would not come back to parliament if they were not given justice. I believe that giving them justice is in my control, my right, within the, the, the government, the democratic government, elected governments of UP and India. We will do that. But it isn't for me to be able to exercise the same right in the United States of America. Therefore, I speak to America through diplomatic channels. And my diplomatic channel has been interrupted. That was my concern. That was my, that was, that was my, 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 my agony, that my diplomatic channel has been, has been interrupted. 
But I want to say it here. I want to say it here, and I don't mind if anybody writes an editorial against this. We have an extremely, exceptionally valuable relationship with the United States of America. And I do believe that they have similar sentiments about us. Can something in which an enormous investment has been put in by both countries, both of emotions, of, the, of, of economic instruments, of, of political outreach, enormous amount of investment put in over generations. And when we had reached the pinnacle of our relationship, the pinnacle of our relationship was that from being a sanctioned, sanction-inflicted country, we became partners in nuclear research and development of peaceful nuclear, nuclear policies. And when we became partners in that, we believe that we had opened a paradigm shift in our relationships. So if some, some small but irksome, hurtful incident happens, do I not have an expectation that my strategic partner will give me the response that I deserve? And do I not know that it is my obligation to give my strategic partner the response that it deserves? Is it unreasonable to say, we must resolve this problem, is it unreasonable to say that we cannot, we cannot tell ourselves that there is no solution to this problem? Is it unreasonable to say that you can talk to Iran about nuclear weapons? Is it unreasonable to say that you can talk to the Taliban in Afghanistan? Is it unreasonable to say that you can shake hands where you dropped the atomic bomb? Is it unreasonable to say that where you lost thousands and thousands of your men in Vietnam, that today you can become their partners? Is it unreasonable to say that people who are your strategic partners have one small expectation that we be allowed to live with dignity? And now we send a diplomat, that diplomat must be allowed to serve with dignity. If you feel, if you feel it's important that we sit down and talk at any level, we must sit down and talk. These days, telephones work. These days, mobile phones can get you anywhere. These days, there are faxes, and these days, there are emails. There is no reason why a conversation of the high quality and the high cadence that we have with the United States of America should get interrupted. But it gets interrupted because there are some people who sit and pontificate and say, this is time for war. But we answer and say, no, the time for war is over. This is time for peace. This is time for nonviolence. This is time for living, living the high principles for which we've just recently celebrated a life, a life unparalleled in our times, the life of Nelson, Nelson Mandela. What Nelson Mandela stood against, what Mahatma Gandhi stood against, and what I believe the President of the United States stands against, I think are not things that can be undermined because some of us, lesser people who do not have a vision, who do not have a conviction, and who perhaps don't understand the enormous responsibility that we owe both to those who have gone before us and those who will have gone after us, continue on some egoistic position to say, I believe this is the right thing to have done. There is no such thing as the right answer in philosophy. You can only try to get the best answer in your pursuit of the right answer. None of us have a right to say we have the right answer. We only have, given the circumstances, the best answer. And my best answer is that two important, valuable friends must be able to say this is not how we must deal with, it, with each other. And I do not mind saying, uh, at the risk of being attacked, I do not mind saying that the United States is a valuable partner and the United States must understand it's a valuable partner and it must understand the value of partnership. Just with those words, I would now like to say to you, how do you want to see us? A land of snake charmers, a land of the Taj Mahal, as a soft power, as an emerging power. I once said somewhere in an international conclave, India doesn't want to be a power. India wants to be a friend. India wants to be a partner. And in the modern day, modern day, uh, conversations that take place internationally and globally. Somebody said, please don't say that again. You will not be taken seriously. You will not be taken seriously if you say that you don't want to be a power. But I do believe, I do believe that the normal descriptions of what is power do not sit in India with comfort. 
Our idea of power is far more philosophical and it's far more, it's, it's, it's far more emotional and it's far more larger, larger than the idea of power that one is accustomed to in international affairs. And I do believe that when you deal with India, you have to deal with diversity of timelines. You have to deal with the India of the past, the present and the future all at the same time. You have to deal with the India in terms of diversity of language, the clothes that we wear, the aspiration that we have, the, the things that we want and the things that we say. You have to look at the, 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 uh, the demographic dividend, the young India that is stirring, that is demanding, that is wanting to contribute. You look at what India is, is able to do. Do not believe that when India speaks, it speaks only because it has its own markets. India speaks because it has a very special relationship with the people for whom it is fought over the centuries. When India speaks in Bali for the poor to get food security, it is not India alone, but many other countries that feel, feel strongly about the same sentiment. And then, not to forget the soft power of India. Indians don't make movies for themselves only. Indians make movies for everybody across the globe, from Russia, to Af from, from Russia to Africa, from Southeast Asia to Latin America. There are Indian movies to which people dance. Even if they don't understand the language, they understand, they understand the music. And then, of course, we are not only at home, we are not just snake, snake charmers at home, but we are actually traveling the globe. And we are coming in a, in a manner which today I believe you would know from your continents, from Europe, from Americas, from, from Africa, that India is there to stay. And I spoke to an African president and I said, I do know that India and China are competitors. I do know that China is here in a big way, but so have we been here in a big way. And how do you see both of us? And he said, very simple, India has, is rooted. China is an important partner for us. China comes, China brings its people, China develops projects, China makes money, and China goes. But India is here to stay. And he pointed to the food that was placed on the table for us to eat, and he said, you think this is yours? And that was an Indian samosa. And I said, yeah, that's a samosa. He said, no, this is an African samosa. This was given to us by India, and this has now become an African samosa. So the power of India is the power of the African samosa. Keep that in mind next time you advertise. Indian companies, Indian companies, I believe, are amongst the outstanding companies. I talked about SER, SR, uh, CSR. I've talked about, talked about the things that, that modern Indian industry is doing in terms of outreach to the people, greater stakeholders being involved in their decision making, grassroots innovation, some of the outstanding work that's being done by outreach, it is being done by, by Indian. Uh, Indian uh, companies. So may I just say to Fiki on this important occasion, never be, never be despondent about, uh, about uh, a couple of things going wrong. We are too large, we, we, we are too large uh, elephantine uh, in our existence to be worried about some little thing going wrong somewhere. We have a determination to overcome, to prevail, and to resolve. I think the important thing is Conflict resolution and differences must be settled as quickly as possible within the country and outside the country because we have destiny calling us. There is a beautiful sunrise waiting for India. There is no sunsets here. It's all about sunrises and we welcome you to the sunrise here today in Fiki. The colors of Fiki may become the colors of your life. The tricolor of India may continue to, to flutter the highest in the world in partnership, in association, in collaboration.